Hello, everyone, and welcome to another GoMobi.Work weekly coaching conversation. Today, we are joined by a very special guest, Dr. Eric Zacherson with UC Santa Barbara and a few other entrepreneurial interests as well. And we are very excited to have Dr. Zacherson with us today because he is going to share a ton of insight with us and with you all about how you can become a better leader, strategies that you can use personally, and if you're the leader of a team, strategies that you can use with your team. So we're super excited to have him here today. Eric, thank you again for joining us. We're very, very happy that you're here. Yeah, my pleasure. Glad to be here. Thanks for the invite. Awesome. Uh, so just to uh, get started, we have a um, mutual connection who introduced us. And one of the things that um, Dr. Zacherson and I have in common is that we are both uh, UCSB alums, UC Santa Barbara alums here in California. And uh, I would love for you, Dr. Zacherson, to tell us what you do at UCSB, maybe just to kick us off. Yeah, yeah, thanks so much. So uh, lucky enough that I, I teach, I'm a lecturer in the technology management uh, department. So at the undergrad level, I teach uh, management uh, strategy and then occasionally the marketing class. And at the grad level, I work with uh, masters of technology management students on business communication uh, and leadership communication. And then occasionally I'll uh, get looped into the communication department and do an interviewing class. Great. Awesome. Yeah. And um, Dr. Zacherson, tell us a little bit about, I, I think TMP as it's called at UCSB is a kind of interesting program. It's a little bit different than a traditional business program. Can you tell the listeners a little bit about how that program is, how it's, it, it's what its mindset is and how it's structured? Yeah. It, um, so it's actually oddly enough housed in the school of engineering and college of engineering. Uh, and it was, its original inception was to teach people coming out of STEM fields, how to manage, how to, how to leverage their ability to um, their technical knowledge and but be able to lead in the industry with people. And so it's kind of morphed over time. And now uh, one of the things I love about it is we get students from all over campus. So, I mean, I think this quarter I've got everything from comm, econ, I've got a philosophy major, I've got some of the hard sciences. So it draws students from all over campus uh, for a certificate program. So it's something above and beyond what they already do. Uh, preparing them to lead and, and manage in uh, primarily technology, technology organizations. And then the grad program, the master's program started in 2015. Uh, so this is our seventh, seventh or eighth cohort. Uh, and that one, most of them are, it's basically an MBA for people wanting to go in technology fields, heavily focused. Most of them end up in product or project management. Great. Yeah, I, I'd love to hear what, uh, you know, your, just if you could share a few of the you know core tenets of of the approach that you're that you're developing. I mean, I think it's really interesting that you've got uh, cross disciplinary students, right? And so think about what what are the, some of those core principles or core tenets that that you uh, that you work with? Yeah. So in in my own classes, I and well, I talk I talk about this a, a bit at the beginning, especially the intro class, which is the strategy class. Because uh, people are like, what is technology management? I said, I'm like, well, really, the interesting thing is, is that almost all, almost all businesses have a technology edge now. Uh, so my background before academia was restaurants, but even in running restaurants, uh, you've got the point of sale system, and now you've got you know manage online sales, and all of that is technology. Uh, right. That even in manufacturing, it's heavily run by robotics now, and so. Technology is, well, and with AI and everything, I think it's just going to be even more so that technology and being able to manage the link between human and technology is important. And then when I talk about the management side of it, I talk about the idea that, you know, kind of core management tenets and understanding how to manage and lead people um, is something that is uh, um, context, context agnostic, if you will, industry agnostic, that leading a group of, of engineers if you know how to motivate and lead uh, people, I can do it with engineers or I can do it with, um, you know, uh, copywriters. Uh, right. And so that's a big, pro a big thing. And the way I always talk about it, especially when I talk about meter leadership and management is that it's by definition a relationship. And so therefore you've got to understand you 
you've got to understand them, but where that happens, where supervision happens, that space between. So it's all a matter of what can I bring to bear to influence uh, and, and manage the space uh, that can impact other people to get them to behave in ways you're hoping for them to behave. Absolutely. Oh my goodness, that I love what you just said there because we are all about managing the space. It's yeah. it's really something that I that we have found in in it is instrumental to doing this kind of thing successfully at a, at an organization wide level. Because I think mm -hmm. some we what we see is some people are naturally good at it, and that yeah. is very nice for them. And you know, maybe the three of us would even count ourselves among that group. But a lot of people don't experience that and it's actually a skill that needs to be honed and learned um, and there's nothing wrong with that and, it, and it's just it comes down to learning these skills so um, as a as a graduate of the program I see this as, as yeah. really really powerful and it's certainly been instrumental to me in, in everything that we're doing yeah. I, I'm interested so one of the things that Wayne and I talk about a lot about is um, you know, there, there's a lot of sort of models of coaching, right? But one of the things that we think is really critical is that uh, effective managers place the employees or the people that they're mentoring or coaching uh, as the drivers of their own development. Yeah. And I wonder what your thoughts are about, you know, for people who are either working on developing those skills or thinking about starting them. What what are your what are your thoughts about? about that uh all right so you're talking about the uh, about the people and developing their own selves or the people that are leading others well so well both like i think one of the models that we see uh, a, a traditional model of coaching is that i'm i'm the more knowledgeable yeah. person i'm going to tell you sort of what you should do um which you know there's it can be really effective in some ways but the idea that you know how can the employee with you know we, we've all got a supervisor yeah. uh, who's presumably be coaching us. So how can we put the person who's in the mentee or the coach E position as the driver of the direction that they should go in and how they, you know, how they track their own yeah. development, all those pieces that is, because, you know, it's really that in our view, that's where it, it sticks, right? The coaching yeah. is, is when they're driving. Well, I mean, it starts with, and I, I love that, the, the coaching perspective, I think, is so important. You know, it's another kind of key piece of what I say we as leaders and supervisors should do. I, I, I always say that, that your goal as a manager, as a leader, as a supervisor should be to develop your employees, right? That, that your goal should be, how do I get them to go? How do I prepare them to go on to whatever they're going to do next? Sometimes that's not even with you. It might be you want a great fit here. I'm going to coach you on how to go do something that you're good at, right? Um but then, you know, I, I think you're, that, that idea of how much control do you take as a coach is a, is a really interesting question. And I think it varies somewhat, right? That it gets to um, certainly, I think, early in with people that are relatively unsure, relatively new, uh, a little bit more of a direct approach, approach can make yeah. sense. But then it's a matter of giving them more and more. And that we know that motivation, a huge part of motivation is autonomy. Do I feel like I have control over what I'm doing? If I don't feel like, if I don't feel like I'm in control, I'm not li as likely to be motivated. And so it's important to make sure that they've got a voice. So as a coach, I think it's important to get the direction they're going and the goals to come emerge from them. And you can do some guidance, right? You can ask questions like, have you thought of this? <laughs> you know, but uh, it, it's it's so much, it's going to be so much, it's going to have so much more sticking power um, mm -hmm. if they feel like they've, like if it's come from within them. Um, and uh, and sometimes it takes really difficult conversations, right? To You know, and it, to say, all right, this is what you're saying you're wanting to do. Mm -hmm. I'm not seeing that capacity in you. Right? Yeah. I'm not seeing that. Or, um, you know, you say that, but every time you've done that, you've seen unhappy doing it. Are you sure? Like, and so having those conversations, I think, is the coach's job um, to really make sure that they are being honest with themselves. Yeah, that, that idea of your, it's almost like a reality check in some ways around, yeah. you know, because we all have that. It's like, here's here's my intention. Here's my actions. What's the difference between those two, right? Yeah. 
I, what I would love to know just as a, as a, as a little branch of this is what you were talking about is so important. And the thing that I'm curious, if you have any insight to any leaders that are listening, we have people that are joining, wanting to know, like, how can I adopt some of these ideas for my team? How would you recommend that somebody create that environment where these conversations are, are able to happen and that leadership and people who are in charge know that that's the space that they ought to create? Well, it starts with it, it starts with you, right? That you can only control yourself, but you can start creating that space. And uh, the way you do that, the way you get other people involved, the way you get your team involved, is you just talk about it explicitly, right? It's the same way with any norm. Like, how do you establish a, how do you establish positive norms? You say, "This is what I think we need to do, uh, and how we should move forward," even if it's a matter of of making a shift. Like I was just talking to one of my one of the grad teams is having a was having some problems with a couple of members that just weren't living up to expectations. And they're like, well, what do we do? And I'm like, we got to talk about it. <laughs> the only way, the only way things are going to change is if you go, hey, here's our issue. What are we going to do? Uh, and so to start getting that coaching environment established and getting people willing to talk, you just start and say, hey, you know, um, you know, I really I, I've been reading or listening or talking about this idea of the power of taking a, a more of a coaching perspective. And I think it's something that we, that I would love to try with us. I think it's be really powerful. So, you know, what are your thoughts? Here's what, how I think it might roll out, you know, and just involve them in the conversation. Um, and then if you're trying to get, you're trying to pitch it up, right? You, you know, you're trying yeah. to manage up and say, hey, I really think we should do this. There's, there's plenty of data out there that talks about, um, you know, how, more motivated people are when they have direction when they're coached and you know uh, so there's there's plenty of data out there that can talk about that you can bring to the table and go here right this is this is the benefits of this yeah are there any um systems or structures within an organization that you think either help getting that started or hinder it in some way? um well it, it always helps if it comes it has to be it, it always helps if it's it, um, company wide, mm -hmm. that um, I mean, there's a lot of great companies out there that recognize it and embrace it. I mean, you know, here locally in Santa Barbara, I know Procore is really well known for it, and their employees love being there. And a part of it is is they've they've embedded a coaching perspective throughout the whole organization. But then you can look at organizations that kind of surprise me that they don't. You know, like Microsoft isn't doesn't have a great coaching culture. Uh, yeah. And the and the people that I've that I've coached uh, from the outside, you know, I've had a couple of clients that work at Microsoft. They're just like, this is it's just tough, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so you really need to get for it to really take hold. It needs to come from the top. And then as far as the specific structure, uh, you know, I, I, I it just kind of varies on the needs. Um, there's a lot of different approaches out there, uh, but certainly it needs to be kind of. It, organizational wide and embraced by leadership. One of the things that I think the three of us chatted about last time we spoke was that we are not fans of the annual performance review, right? <laughs> not nearly often enough. Yeah. Um, what role do you find that feedback plays in growth and like, how could, how could somebody think about creating a system for fee for feedback? Yeah, it's so vital. Uh, I love, um, I make all of my students read Radical Candor by Kim Scott. Awesome. Um, and that idea of it's not fair if, if somebody's doing something you don't like or something you do like, it's not fair to them or to you to not bring it up, to not, to not acknowledge it. Uh, that it's not fair to you because you're putting up with something you shouldn't have to put up with, but it's not fair to them either that they might not know. You're not giving them the opportunity, especially as a manager, as a leader, right? That you're not giving them the opportunity to get better if you're not giving them really honest feedback. Uh, and the idea of, yeah, man, I still I still occasionally work with companies that do the annual review. And, it, you know, it's like, so yeah, back in June, you did this. I'm right. like, great. <laughs> Whoop de right. do. Right. <laughs> uh, but it's, you know, um, the the magic number is a little tricky. I think it's always got to be a little it bit is. of a blend. Uh, in our 
kind of more commonly remote workplace, it's even trickier because I was talking about, I'm like, things you should do is, you know, as a leader, as a manager, you should do kind of pop-ins and just say, hey, how's it going? And check with people kind of on a, on a you know, hallway or, you know, water cooler check. That's a little tougher to do. Virtually, you have to actually schedule those things, but you can schedule, hey, you know, let's just do a 10 minute check-in, um, you know, on Wednesdays just to say, hey, uh, and then a more consistent kind of one-on-one -on -one, uh, where whether that's weekly or bi-weekly, half hour, hour, whatever the needs of the kind of complexity of the work, but make sure that some of that it, it, that that isn't all about here's what you did well here's what you did wrong da, 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 that it's a conversation that you're building a relationship with them you're finding out more about them than than just the work part of it uh and you're using that as an opportunity to not just hammer them with mistakes but it's a, always a matter of staying how what can we do to make sure you're successful right uh and then you do the you know and then you know most organizations you have to have the performance review uh, for, you know, organizational raises and that kind of stuff. It's not ideal, but, you know, that should be tied to specific KPIs uh, that are kind of the uh, specific things that are needed for that team to succeed. And then all of the coaching along the path is, hey, what can we do to make sure you're hitting those KPIs as well as possible? So it's kind of a, a, a multi-tiered approach. Um, and that they've got a voice in, okay, so what do you, what are you trying to accomplish now? What do you want to accomplish next? Uh, and what are the kind of smart goals within that, that we can help you accomplish? Um, and so it's that kind of multi-pronged approach. I think that's, that's important. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Absolutely. Yeah, we, um, something that Wade and I are also a, a core part of what what we're we really work to explore is this the concept of alignment within an organization. Yeah. Um, you know, one of one of the things, you know, I've experienced myself, I think Wade's experience we probably all have is that, you know, when you get multiple perspectives, when you're the when you're the sort of the bottom rung employee like executing this yeah. stuff, <laughs> and you get multiple perspectives about what should be done or how it should be done. Um I just, you know, to me, you know, I've always found that to be uh difficult um but i wonder you know just what yeah you're, you're not yeah you you agreed immediately and we talked about this before but i'm interested in your thoughts about this concept of alignment within an organization yeah it's funny it, uh so you asked do we have a framework uh and we actually do we use the uh, congruence model uh for uh the framework of uh kind of how we look at organizations for that for the tmp program uh, mm -hmm. And the congruence model really looks at first, there's a strategy bit and outcomes, but the management class is we look at kind of the key pieces and the four kind of key parts are uh, organizational structure, organizational culture, uh, critical tasks and people. And then there's all the various pieces like teams and decision making and all that. Uh, mm -hmm. But it, it's a it's a diagnostic tool, basically, uh, to say, let's look at these and um, if you've got outcomes that you're that are not ideal, right? Uh, it, is there, oftentimes there's incongruencies in the organization that's causing that to happen, that something isn't aligned. And it can be, it's just not aligned completely, right? That that you are, um, you know, saying that you're, uh, that you're customer centric, but you're rewarding, you know, you're Wells Fargo and you're, re you know, rewarding individual uh, people putting in individual accounts, right? That it, they just don't right. align. So uh, that's part of it, right? And so if you're trying to do, if you're trying to get, motivate people, which coaching really is a, a yep. motivation tool to get them to go in a particular direction. If you're trying to get an organization to go in a particular direction and everybody within it to do it, all the pieces have to be aligned in the same direction. You've got to be rewarding people. Uh, you know, you can't punish people for, uh, as part of the coaching process. If they're, you know, if, if you want people to say, I'm having a challenge with this. I need to get better at it. You don't want to punish them for saying they made a mistake. Right. Right. Uh, um, and, and so that, but that has to be all the way from the top to the bottom. And yeah. So I, you're right. I think alignment is, is vital. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. And difficult to achieve. Like, uh, you know, oh, yeah. in our words, it takes a lot of attention to the, you know, yeah. And, I, you know, here's what we say we do. Here's what we actually do. What's the difference? And paying attention to that piece. 
Yeah, and I think with that, part of that is, you know, um, we all, we forget that other people are different than us and think differently and perceive differently and, and approach work differently. That, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Zoltan, you may be somebody who goes to work and what's work about? Man, work is about getting things done. And, you know, it's like, yeah, well, yeah, but it's getting things done with people. Right. Uh, and um, so then people use that lens to look at any initiative you have. Mm -hmm. um, and so we always have to remember that when we're when we're doing anything from an organizational perspective, we've got to make sure that we're thinking about how that's perceived and how that's going to be engaged from other people and get their buy in as well. Because um, otherwise, yeah, you miss out. Yeah, absolutely. This is, this is, I'm going to take this opportunity to do a to do a segue into something that I really have been wanting to ask you about. Yeah. Eric, it, there is something that I've, we talked about this a minute before we jumped on and started recording here, but one of the things that you have pioneered really is the IDI. And I okay. know that there are, there are two things that the IDI mentions and it's your, um, your, the relationship builder aspect and your um, assertiveness, like how much you try to go, get things done and how people, but it's also a self rating and somebody else rating you. Yeah. Will you tell us a little bit about that? So yeah. Whatever. So I wouldn't say I necessarily pioneered it. It's been around for um, a, almost 40 years. My dad actually developed it uh, back in the mm -hmm. uh, 70s, early 80s. Uh, and now it's uh, owned by uh, a company that he owned in Sweden called Interpersonal Dynamics um, uh, Inventory. Or I think it's called IDI Profiling now. Uh, and I've got the rights to it in the U.S. market. Um, and I use it a lot. And so, uh, yeah, what it does is it, it actually measures three things. Two of them identify the role that you take on a team. And I think the power, as you noted, is that it's a self-rater. So you um, identify where on those barriers, and there, there it's a continuous spectrum, right? It's from often to, to rarely, uh, how often are you directive? Um, and, uh, you know, so I use the analogy, are you a book or a trumpet? Uh, so if you're a book, somebody has to know what page to turn to to know what you think. If you're a trumpet, you walk in the room and everybody knows. Right. And then the other the other measure is um, affiliation, which is a measure of how often you're perceived as wanting to build or manage relationships with people. And it breaks into kind of the four key roles. Now, I think it's always important to note that the measures themselves are, are, are more important because that's what we can adjust. Right. I can be more or less affiliative, more or less directive as needed. Um, and note that there's not a good or bad. Right. That there are situations where as a leader, I very much should worry less about the relationship and more about just, you know, making sure that the things are getting done. There are certainly times where leading from behind is more important than leading from, you know, the front and vice versa. Um, but we end up with those kind of four key functions in each, any organization needs. We need people that are um, focused on relationships and making sure that we have cohesion. Uh, we're, we need people that are focused on innovation and growth and newness. We need people focused on just getting things done, and we need people pro focused on process. And so the power of that, you know, to this is it it's you can identify what you think you do, but, but what's more much more important, again, where do we lead in that space between us? It It's what people see you doing. Uh, and then that speaks to the fact that we can adapt and we should adapt, which is the third thing we measure, and that there are times where uh, with adaptability, it's always a matter of reading the situation and say, should I adapt? And then how can I adapt? So uh, uh, some teams, like young teams that don't have um, the relationships, they don't really know what they're doing well, the relationships aren't really well established yet, et cetera. Being really highly flexible and adaptable is probably important, right? That we need to build, we need to know what's going on. So we need to ramp that up a lot. But in a team that, you know, we've worked together, we all know each other, et cetera, being really adaptable and, and adjusting all the time is problematic, right? Because people are like, I don't know what to expect from you. Yeah. Uh, and so it helps identify what you're doing in a context uh, and then lets you evaluate, am I doing what I need to do or not, right? So for example, I was working with somebody last week who was uh, what we would call a pro the role he was taking was a processor. So very seldom both, very seldom affiliative, very seldom directive. Uh, and what the feedback he was getting from his team was, we don't feel like you don't, we don't feel like you like us. We don't feel like, you know, you care about us. Um, they acknowledge that his, like, they appreciate how focused he is on making sure all the, you know, 
all the T's are crossed, all the I's are dotted. And so for him, we coached on, so how can you be more affiliative, right? So things like, you know, building his listening skills, um, uh, asking questions more, um, you know, those kinds of things. And so he was working on those and he actually was able to, to the next time we assessed him, he moved up and, and actually his team was seeing that in him and, and it was a positive benefit. So it's a, I think it's a, anytime we, and again, this gets to coaching. I think we have to be really aware and when we're developing people and we're coaching people that we are basing that coaching on their interaction with others, right? Not what their personality in their head is, because is that useful? Sure, right? I think anytime we pay attention, that is important, but it's so much more important to think about the interaction because we're talking about what you're doing in the workplace, what you're doing with other people. And so making sure people are working on showing up in a particular way, uh, I think is the, is the more important part and because that's where, that's where we, that's where we interact with them. Right. And I love that example. Cause it, you know, it's, you know, a lot of times we think about, so, you know, what, what are those big, uh, you know, the key results or the goals that we have and how can we coach into those? You know, so this, this person probably had a goal of, you know, uh, better functioning uh, team, you know, a team spirit, but you're you're coaching on micro behaviors in some ways, which is really, you know, and I think we sometimes miss the point. We look at the bigger picture and it's really, uh -huh. uh, it's, it's actually, how do you ask a question rather than how do you, you know, you know, for coaching around, well, let's get, you know, let's get uh, people's input more. It's like, okay, that's a goal. Yeah. What's the thing that we do to get there? Yeah. What's the tactic, right? Yeah. 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 I think that's an important thing to, because those are the skills, right? That, you know, people, you know, uh, I'll always ask my class, you know, when we talk about leadership, I was like, is it, is it learned or is it innate? And we generally always come to the, the same conclusion that there are certainly people that naturally have it. Right. right. But I always have to there. I've always got a couple of students that are like, no, there's certain people that just can't learn. it. And I was like, everybody can learn it. Mm -hmm. right? It's because they're it's skills. Right. It, and there are specific skills, specific tactics you can use. They might not be, you know, uh, they might. You, there's people that might not turn into like stellar charismatic leaders, but you don't have to be a charismatic leader, charismatic leader to be a good leader. One of the things I love about everything that you shared about IDI is that one of the things that we talk about, and we've talked about this together before too, but it's that behaviors are much more malleable and mm -hmm. coachable than personality. Yeah. Like if you're, if you're coming at somebody for like, Hey, the, you, and, and Zoltan actually has given an amazing talk. If you're watching this on our YouTube channel, go back and look at our original talk that when we started this series, it's on attribution theory. Mm -hmm. uh, Attribution theory, which Zoltan so eloquently talks about in this talk, is how we tend to uh, create biases in our own brain about what are the qualities of somebody else based on the situation that we're in. So if we're in a stressful situation, it may become our tendency to say, that person's just lazy. Why didn't, why couldn't they do that right? Whereas if you're in a situation where you're, where you're, there's, and this is just a generalization. So go watch the video. Cause there's a lot, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, but if you're in a situation where there's less on the line, you might be more likely to say, well, that person maybe had something going on at home or there, you know, this was actually a really hard thing and we didn't really teach them something, which is actually more, usually more accurate than that person just didn't do it because they're lazy. Um, I'm see, I see you nodding your head over there. So I must be talking about something that you know. Well, yeah, I think that's, it, it's funny because I think that's one of the things that always worries me about people when they do personality assessments, like, you know, yeah. Briggs or DISC, like those things are useful, but mm -hmm. what, where, where they get used wrong so often is they, they are identified as a label, yes. right? That then says, well, this is how I have to, this is how I have to interact with that person because they are this. Yeah. And it's part of who they are, but it's not all. And additionally, and this is why, like with IDI, we don't let people get their IDI profile just off the way, right? You have to go through a facilitator mm -hmm. uh, for, for ethical reasons, because we know, I, know, I mean, you, everybody watching likely knows at least one person that has done something like a disc or something and then uses yeah, sure. it as an excuse for behavior, 
mm-hmm. uh, that I've heard a guy that was just an ass to people. He's like, well, I'm a high D. It's just what I do. And I'm like, no, <laughs> I'm like, no, that is not okay. It's not yeah. what that's supposed to be. Even you can change. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, no, but oh I think, my God. yeah, and so, you know, I think I love, it really resonates with a lot of what we've talked about is that what's our, is our interpretation that it's something um, innate or dispositional about the person or about ourselves, or is it yeah. something that's contextual and where do we have power? Yeah, if we actually, if we can think about it as a context, we have power over the context, you know, and so, um no, I love that. Yeah, that's so true. And even for myself, like, you know, so I'm that kind of person, but what kind of situations am I that kind of person? So then I then I can start to think about other um, aspects of my life that, that I'm not that way. Yeah. Well, and then you you combine attribution error with the air that we have about ourselves and that we generally think we're better than we are. Yeah. Right? You know, you ask everybody, how good of a driver are you? Like 70% of people say they're better than average. I was like, that's not possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely no but and i really appreciate you know i i i think i i really do appreciate in the field today that there is a lot more connection to psychological research yeah and at the same time that understanding is you know a psychologist has such a deep training to be able to do that work and when we put some of these things in people's hands and say okay so this is how you this is how this is a technique you can use it, it's again as you said it goes to stereotyping yep. or misinterpretation exactly. or yeah. gross okay. oversimplification exactly yeah. yeah 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 absolutely yeah i love that you guys pay attention to that yeah yeah i mean these things are all uh i mean just to as Altan just said it, it's 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 instrumental to doing person to to developing people well, and and there are so many tools out there that are attempting to do that, and there are so many different approaches out there that it becomes really easy to almost. And we were just having a conversation about this yesterday um, in our in our in our meeting where we we were talking about how there just, there needs to be an element of interpretation for everybody. And, and you can be, try to be as efficient as you can, but there isn't ever going to be a one size fits all approach. People change and that's good, but we need to acknowledge that it's not a static environment that we're operating in. And that makes it tricky, yeah. <laughs> which is why the help of an expert is really, really helpful because yeah. it, it is, it's a tricky thing to get right. Yeah. Yeah. Most certainly. Most certainly. Excellent. Well, I um, I know we're we're wrapping up pretty soon here, but I do have one question, and it's a little bit more on the conceptual side. And I'd love to know, Dr. Zagerson, what you where you think things are headed in the de- employee development space. This is something that we're really excited about, obviously. And I just want to know from your perspective, maybe from what you're seeing in your work, everything else. Really appreciate it. Bye. Yeah, I think it's heading in the right direction. Right, that I think uh, more and more organizations are seeing the need for uh, professional and interactive development and, and developing their teams and coaching their teams. I think the perspective of coaching, uh, from a coaching perspective is becoming more and more prevalent. Um, I, I do worry a little bit about, because I think you know when you see the big tech layoffs, uh, that those one of the things that gets let go too, too readily is oh we're not gonna we're not gonna develop our team. I was like, well, that's problematic because you're letting people go, and then the people there. Uh, so that's one of the things that worries me a little bit is that it, it tends to get cut early um, in in budgeting issues when arguably it's one of the things you should probably throw mo- more money at because you want to yeah. keep the employees you've got. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. But yeah, a- and it, you know I, I'm excited to see kind of the technology and how technology helps uh manage uh coaching uh, at an organizational level and, and at an individual level kind of what what's going to be kind of coming up the and i'm glad and i'm glad that i do something that uh, isn't really impacted by ai <laughs> <laughs> ai only helps me it can't replace uh, yeah. right, right. <laughs> i don't think it'll ever be that human but uh, <laughs> it's interesting because i love what, you know that that pete piece of what's cut first. I, just before we got on this call, I was talking with a gentleman and he's, 
he said, you know, these, these people know the cost of everything and the value of nothing. Yeah. Yeah. So That's a great quote. quote. Yeah. I know, it's just like, I wrote it down when he, when he said it. So it, true. It just applies to everything. But, yep. Yeah. And it's, it, I, I couldn't agree more. And it's crazy to see that like, they're slashing some of the, like there's disproportionate number of DE and I employees that are being cut. And yeah. I'm like, we, you gotta, this is just not these, this is, it's, it's, I, there's a really interesting, if, if anybody watches the, it listens to the Tim Ferriss podcast, he had Seth Godin on this week and they were talking about the, the needs of business to focus on profit versus the needs of business to focus on creativity. It's a really interesting conversation, but I think it speaks to that. Like there's, there, there's an over and there's an over indexing in a lot of the, especially now as we're entering this kind of like fear cycle of, yeah. Oh God, things are happening. And so the businesses just clamp down and they cut all these, they cut all these, you know, programs that are really providing a ton of value, but are expensive, you know, quote unquote. Yeah. But why do you think coaching is so successful? Uh, oh, let's end on that. Um, well, because it, it, it goes back to that idea of people feeling like they've got some control, right? That what coaching is at the end of the day is giving some control and guidance to the person, the employee. Uh, and when people feel like they have control and they have autonomy, um, that they're more motivated uh, and they're more engaged and they're more successful because they've got a path to go uh, that aligns with their needs and their interests. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Just way to finish. Yep. Eric, Dr. Zacherson, thank you so much yeah, for being here. My pleasure, here. guys. It's yeah. really, really, we love having you around and hopefully we get to do this a bunch more times because it's really great to have you in our sphere and to talk and have this opportunity to, to do this. So thank awesome. you again. Lovely to talk to you guys as well. Always a pleasure. All yeah. right, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you next week for another coaching conversation. Have a great one. Mm -hmm.